Hey, what's up guys? This is Oakley, and I am indeed on break, but I was going to bring you a couple more videos. I'll upload those. Maybe uh, they'll probably be going up the day of, and then I'll release one tomorrow. In any case, I'm going to be following up some more videos that I saw, uh, basically from the outburst of videos. So I'll be covering this. Uh, and right now, I'm actually, I landed in Lutetia, which was basically um, the ancient name for Paris. So that was a, a city that the Romans took over in Gaul and it later developed into Paris obviously and right now I'm in the Alps actually and we're gonna be headed over to Italy so following the steps of Hannibal's conquest we're gonna be conquering Rome 2 news right now as I head into Italy and as we dive into these videos so yeah stay tuned so we're gonna start off right here at Capua this is again the prologue campaign that another person was able to walk through but they went through it in a lot more detail it wasn't really the pre-scripted one I think they had a lot more ability to play around with the different options so one of them here is just, again, looking at the cities. Um, I know some of this you may have already seen, but I think it's cool to see the inside of it, and I'll touch up on the details. So if you look on the left, when you look at your city, you kind of have to keep in mind what the culture is like in your city. If you have too many cultures clashing, there can be unrest. Um, keep in mind where your public order is at. Also, the food. Food is something you have to manage in terms of your city. Um, as it develops, your people will need more food, so make sure you supply it to them. When you upgrade your capital city, for example, here, upgrading it to a provincial capital, you get some buffs and bonuses, so more growth, more wealth, more spread of your own faction's culture, um, and buildings in general do better, but also you get a garrison, so, you know, one unit of Hastati, two of Plebs, three of uh, Rarari, those look like some sort of uh, basic pike units, and then two of these bow levies, uh, basically to man your walls and shoot down arrows, so this is going to be a rough fighting force, but you get a decent amount of units for free whenever you defend a city. And if you want to have even more defenses, you can station an army in your cities. But basically what this means is uh, taking cities, the main cities at least, is going to be harder because you get all these free units to defend. So it's going to make um, a lot of the battle and fighting take place in the countryside, have a lot to do with agents, and also be more of a um, strategic sense. You can't just go and knock out these main cities for a variety of reasons. Here you can see again, once you expand your city and you have a new building tile, you can go ahead and recruit, or not recruit, but build various structures. So it seems like here you can have more martial things. Um, it looks like there's a furnace, which will help you basically have, I think, better armor or textiles or something like that. You can see some stuff that looks like temples. Um, and what's on the top left looks either like some sort of temple or prison, but the Romans weren't known for having prisons. They mostly exiled or crucified people um, who would have other gone to prison. So not much use for the prisons there. Uh, anyways, here you can see they're pointing at the food and it talks about um, basically this Rome has 17. So keeping your population happy is going to be very important. Otherwise, they'll have riots and public order will go basically awry. And I just wanted to point out again, um, Rome at various stages of development. So you can see here early on it has stuff. Um, you can see the, the Roman numerals there, one or two, that basically tells you how upgraded it is. So, of course, Rome right here does not have much going for it. Just some basic... Um, administrative buildings, the amphora there, and wine, so basically Rome, it looks like, has vineyards, some meat uh, in order to provide food for its people, and then the eagle right there is, I'm guessing, some sort of military camp or mustering camp. Anyways, you see right here, one of the legions, basically, uh, one of the, the, the larger full banners that you can see moving out, and uh, it does have 17 out of 20 forces, so it looks like the max will be 20. I've heard somewhere that you can up it to 40. Now, I'm not sure if that's like a box you tick before you do the campaign, or like a setting option where you'll have 40 but uh, I have heard at some point you'll be able to command 40 when you choose to. So maybe that's in terms of reinforcements coming in, two stacks. Or maybe it's, you know, a one stack can all of a sudden, with a check of a button, be expanded to, um, here it would say, 17 out of 40. Uh, but that's something we'll have to wait and see. In any case, if your computer can handle it, I'm sure there'll be a way to do it. Um, also here, you know, we check back on Rome and it's further developed. You can see here, one of the new tiles that's being upgraded. Uh, you can do a variety of things. So here, of course, the public forum is the thing that looked like uh, it was a prison. So again, of course, it's not a prison. You can see there the shackles. So that's, that has to do with slaves. Um, and you can see they're kind of, they're, they have red on them. And then I think that's either because you don't have the technology to research them or maybe the building points or money to research them. Although it looks like money really isn't a concern for this player. Uh, so it's probably a research one. Anyways, you can see the amphitheater that you can uh, recruit that does take technology. Then you have the cattle trader below it. So basically, the things you're going to see in all Roman cities as they spread their culture was going to be the forum, um, some form of entertainment, be it a coliseum, a circus, in terms of the Circus Maximus, like some sort of racing arena, or an amphitheater. And then, of course, the Roman barracks stationed in all of their towns as garrison forces. So that was kind of the, the three things you'd see in all the Roman cities. And, of course, in Rome itself, these are going to be on a more massive scale and definitely much more impressive. Uh, here, as I said, the, the cattle trader that you can see here makes an appearance. 
Um, you know, adds to your wealth, adds to the food and stuff like that, provides for your people. Of course, you want to develop all branches of your city. You don't want to just, of course, be military. Um, make sure you branch out, provide for your people's needs, and you have the economy rolling as well. Um, that's just what I wanted to point out. Um, anyways, we're checking out uh, the other city here, and I'm going to pause right here and talk briefly about farms. So farms are vastly important um, for a couple of reasons. The first reason is farms just right here benefit you in terms of food. So food is something that makes your population happy. Food is something you have to regulate on a per city basis. Um, buildings will cause cities to consume food. So you kind of have buildings that negate your food supply and some that, some that add to it. And you always want to stay in the, the positive side of it because otherwise your population will start starving. Um, also, these farms basically allow you to trade grain, which is a resource. But in a broader context, what I wanted to talk about for farms is farms were at the, the center of the Roman society. Of course, all these societies in ancient uh, civilizations were reliant on farms and small trades. Not many people lived in the cities, but especially for Rome, the farmer was important. It was kind of seen in the Republican era and later on as the ideal of a Roman soldier. So, for example, the legions were basically conscripted soldiers, or volunteer soldiers, I should, I should say, people who would basically have to meet a certain level of requirement in terms of property holding, so they would have to be small farmers, especially in the early history of Rome. That's where they got their legions from. That's where they recruited them. But what happened over time is as Rome, you know, uh, got more wealth and there were more wars and legions were deployed further and further afield, basically they weren't able to tend to their farms and so their farms um, deteriorated, they went bankrupt. At the same time, you know, Hannibal's invasion, slave revolts, they kind of ravaged the countryside around Rome. So what you saw over time is the, the deterioration of the capacity of Roman citizens to actually have small farms. And instead of these small farms, what you saw was the rise of the Latifundia, which are basically large estates owned by the elites, which were run by slaves. And so these basically, uh, as there were more and more wars, soldiers would deploy further and further afield and they could less tend to their crops. At the same time, those wars supplied the elite with more and more money. And so the rich got richer, the poor got poorer. And what happened is basically because they did not reach the uh, the minimum property requirements, they, there were no more, there was a deteriorating uh, level of people eligible to be in legions. This was a very big problem for the Romans. And that's what kind of led to the Marian reforms later on, which uh, basically eliminated the property requirements and allowed for the poor to rise up and join the army. And that was a big shift in Rome. It led to its eventual demise because it was a professional army where those troops were basically attached to the general, and that led to a lot of civil wars. Also, in terms of the importance of farms, that was the ideal Roman. Um, so Cincinnatus, for example, was in a time of trouble. He was elected dictator. He defeated Rome's armies, laid down his power, and returned to his farm. And he was referred to, in, you know, on many occasions as the ideal general, served nobly for the nation, and then returned humbly to his farm to work an honest life. And Cincinnatus, that's where the city Cincinnati got its name from, uh, Cincinnati, excuse me. Um, and it was named after George Washington because George Washington, similar to Cincinnati, had great command uh, and he had the ability to go on and lead. He had the political capital to do it, but he stepped down and laid down his power and set a precedent of having two terms. So that's where we get Cincinnati from is Cincinnati. Cincinnati was named after George Washington for what he did and his actions were basically reflecting on this ancient Roman dictator, Cincinnati. Um, anyways, you, right here you can see the upgrading of the cities. So this is going to be a minor settlement. Rome is going to have the big um, walls and all that stuff. And the minor settlements are going to have not as many walls, but you can still see here when you do upgrade your city, you still get that garrison force and uh, stuff like that. But, uh, you know, again, the development in these smaller settlements is not as big, especially when you compare it to Rome, which would eventually be one of the largest cities in the ancient world. At least, uh, you know, in Europe, it went to, uh, some believe, have over a million occupants and inhabitants. So Rome was, you know, a very, very large city. Uh, and Syracuse here, I wanted to point out, uh, Syracuse, very important city. And that's where Archimedes actually sought refuge. And uh, he was instrumental in leading the defense of the city. He was a very well-known um, sort of engineer. He was good at geometry. And he devised these elaborate cranes and things that would pick up Roman boats and smash them against the cliffs. And a lot of this was embellished, but he did help them hold out for much longer. But eventually the Romans pushed in and Archimedes was killed by a legionnaire. So a sad end to, uh, you know, a really brilliant man's life. But in any case, I'm going to leave you guys there. See you guys next time. I've got a couple more videos. See y'all uh, later.